and welcome to another episode of Public Health Matters with the Uncas Health District. I'm your host, Patrick McCormick, and we have another great guest today. We have Jennifer Muggio, who is the Ledgelite Health District Jack of all trades, <laughs> supervisor, <laughs> administrator of finance and special projects. Kind of got that right? Yeah, close enough. <laughs> all right. And Jen was kind enough to come and speak to us today about some of the projects they're doing around the community health assessment and the community health improvement plan, which I thought was a wonderful opportunity for us to discuss since we're going through the same project at Uncas Health District. And it's an opportunity for us to share with the public how much work we've put into this effort and the purpose of it. Great. Um, so why don't we start with uh, talk a little bit about Ledgley Health District and the communities that you serve. Okay, well thanks for having me. Um, Ledgley Health District serves as the local health department for several communities along the shoreline. East Lyme, Groton, Ledger, New London, Waterford, and most recently Old Lyme. Um, so we have about 128,000 residents that we are the public health department for. And uh, just like Uncas, we provide a wide range of services ranging from environmental health uh, to health education and epidemiology and lots of things in between. All right. And how long have you been at Ledgley Health District now? In March, it'll be 12 years. Wow. Yeah. And I've actually been at Uncas for 12 years. That's so right. We yeah, started about the same yeah, time. Things, things <laughs> just got better for the region after we arrived, I'm sure. So now I understand with the community health assessment and community health improvement plan that um, to become accredited as a health district, health department, um, that that's part of the process. So maybe you could just explain um, why it is that you want to become accredited and how you started the process of the health assessment and health improvement plan. Sure. Well, as you know, the, uh, recently, uh, in the scheme of things, the Public Health Accreditation Board rolled out a number of standards, standards and measures for health departments to meet to become an accredited health department. And certainly, Ledgelite um, is uh, eager to attain accreditation on a schedule that's reasonable in light of the other things that we have to right. do every right. day. Um, but one of the primary things that any health department has to achieve before they can even think about applying for accreditation is to have a comprehensive community health assessment and community health improvement plan. And so uh, we w put a lot of thought into how were we going to move forward with those projects. At the same time, the IRS recently, um, again, recently in the scheme of things, rolled out some new regulations for community nonprofit hospitals. And we have Lawrence and Memorial Hospital in our jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And so they were required also to complete a community health assessment and community health improvement plan. And we were speaking with our colleagues at LNM and agreed that it made sense for us to join forces and do this collaboratively. We could certainly, um, by putting our brains and our limited budgets together, have a more comprehensive and effective assessment and plan than if each of us try to do our separate, uh, go our separate ways. So. And can you tell me, I, I think there's some alignment and maybe some non-alignment between what the hospitals are trying to do and, and the health departments and health districts. So can you speak to the sort of that time frame and how you're working through that process? Sure, so um, certainly there, there are lots of alignments in that uh, both the hospitals and health departments are looking to really have a good understanding of the health status of the communities, to especially to identify where inequities exist and where populations are um, carrying disproportionate burdens of disease, illness, and injury. Um, at the same time, some of the requirements are slightly off from mm -hmm. each other. The hospitals have to complete this process every three years, uh, whereas the accreditation cycle is every five years for health departments. Also, as you know, um, especially in southeastern Connecticut, if you kind of look at um, a map of the towns in our region and county and uh, who's responsible for providing services where, there's not a direct alignment. Um, l and primary service area includes more towns than Ledgelite's jurisdiction, and in fact, it includes one of your towns, Patrick, uh, Montville. And so we had to work through some of those um, questions as to how we'd, what geographic scope the assessment would look at and how we would align things. And uh, we appreciate the participation of you and your staff in this process um, to reflect the fact that it was bigger than just Ledgelite. Of course we would do that. <laughs> and actually, uh, Westerly Hospital probably um, throws a little wrench in the system, but I would assume, you know, we, what we've found is in our region, um, you know, there's people who work in our region that may not live in our region or live in our region that may not work in our region. So um, there may be people who live in your region that use Westerly Hospital or people that live or work in Westerly that may use L&M. So I'm sure there's some 
um, things where you have to just kind of push the jurisdictional thing away and say, you know, what are we trying to provide in terms of services and, and assessment for the whole community. Absolutely. So. And, and that extends, too, to the community partners that we have participating in this process with us. Um, I mentioned that UNCAS uh, staff has been with us all along. Um, mm. We've been working on this for over 18 months now. Um, but we have a, a pretty dedicated group of community partners who meet pretty much monthly, um, and we're so grateful for their their participation in this. We really, although Ledgelight and l &M have kind of spearheaded this effort and mm -hmm. certainly facilitated things, we really hope this is a true community health improvement plan and that as a community, we'll be identifying strategies and tactics to take together or certain segments of us, certain subgroups of us, um, so that we can achieve some real measurable progress. Um, you know, and, and along those lines, you know, many of the community agencies that are participating mm -hmm. have that same kind of fluctuating uh, boundary in right. terms of some of them being organizations that serve the whole county or some of them serve uh, more of the towns in the northern tier or the UNCAS jurisdiction or more of the towns in the ledge light jurisdiction. So, you know, I think that we're really lucky in our area to have such an engaged group of partners who are willing to be flexible um, with how things roll out and develop. And well, and I, I think some of those challenges we face in terms of those jurisdictional issues are part of why I like the process you've been through where you've used people uh, that are familiar with the community, be it yourself, your epidemiologist, uh, folks from L&M uh, who know that those boundaries exist and they know uh, where the boundaries exist. So, you know, I know we have councils of governments and we have, you know, county which sort of exists and sort of doesn't. <laughs> Um, we have uh, uh, departments that, you know, may fall into a certain region, whether it be uh, mental health, uh, public health preparedness, um, and none of those lines seem to, to work together. Um, so you have to, you know, that's been one of the challenges I know we've looked at is um, who do we really serve and how can mm -hmm. we properly identify those folks? So maybe you can take a step back with me and say, you know, before the community health assessment even started, how did you start to... Um, to decide what your approach was going to be to, to the whole process. Um, did you have to think about the finances first? Did you have to think about the partners first? Did it all kind of come together at the same time? So maybe you could speak to that for me. Yeah, so the finances are definitely part of this. Um, the recent update to the FAB accreditation standards require um, that a health department's community health assessment include some primary data collection. It can't simply be taking some um, analysis of records that was done by the state and localizing it. Um, and so uh, we were fortunate that at the same time that we started to talk about how this would look like, um, Data Haven, which is an organization out of New Haven that's been doing community surveys down there for some time now, mm -hmm. um, was pursuing the idea of doing their well-being survey on a statewide basis. Okay. Um, and so our epidemiologist, Russell Melmed, was um, able to actually join the team that was working to look at what that, tel what ended up being a telephone survey would, would look like um, and how it would be structured. And we were able to, um, with funding from Ledgelight and l and but also with um, some grant funding from the Community Foundation of Eastern Connecticut, for which we were, were very grateful. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to contract with Data Haven so that when they called people in our jurisdiction, um, they would call enough people mm -hmm. um, that it would re be representative of our individual towns. And then we could speak to things on a local level and not just at the state level. Um, so that yielded some really rich localized data for us. Um, that if we had had, if that wasn't happening at the mm -hmm. same time, um, we, it would have cost us way too much money right. to contract with somebody to do a survey just for us. Right. So, so we timing were, is everything. Timing is everything. <laughs> we were fortunate in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, we were also fortunate to have an epidemiologist on our staff, um, and Russ was a, a key part of our team on this, uh, Russ and I from Ledgelight. And, um, so he is able to um, access some of the secondary data from the state and also from the Connecticut Hospital Association. And then on top of that, our community partners who have been part of the process were so instrumental um, in some of the qualitative data analysis and organizing um, some focus groups among certain key populations that we really wanted to hear from. Right. 
Um, and so all of these pieces just came together. And well, if you were running. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think the interesting part has been the conversation you have with some of these organizations. They say, you know what, I just had to do a similar assessment. I just had to get data from here. Um, I wish it was all in one place because, you know, that's been our big issue is uh, we have to collect data just as much as you do, and yet, you know, nobody seemed to be coming together to discuss um, when do they have to be on a certain schedule to collect data, what types of data do they have to collect, um, where do they get their information from, what dates do they have to have so that they align the information. So uh, maybe you can speak to some of those challenges. I mean, you know, 2010 data to 2015 data can be quite different. Um, so how do you work through that data to make sure that it sort of, you know, paints a picture and it's an accurate picture that you're painting? Yeah, it, it is an ongoing challenge. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, we did have, I think there are um, maybe people who feel that some things are missing from our health assessment mm -hmm. because we did have some strict um, requirements um, in terms of what we included. And, and that is that we wanted to look at in indicators and measures that um, did could be reported at the local level, mm -hmm. not just at the state level, um, and that were somewhat up to date, okay. and that also would be able to be measured again in our next iteration of this, mm -hmm. whether it be three or five years from now. So, for example, it's hard to come by local um, data about childhood health mm -hmm. outcomes. Um, we certainly have some data around lead, um, elevated blood lead levels um, and asthma. Right. But, you know, even with the heightened focus at the national level on childhood obesity, right. those rates um, are not necessarily easily available at the local level. And so the, our assessment doesn't speak to that. And I think, you know, some people may feel that that's a shortcoming and certainly maybe moving forward um, as we continue to work as a region mm -hmm. and I'm grateful for you bringing this mm -hmm. up at the uh, collaborative meetings mm -hmm. that we really need to have a data committee who's looking at how are we collecting data locally and who's holding what data and how c can we better share. And um, certainly so if you have people that uh, feel like there's gaps or areas that need additional focus I think that's a real positive. You know we're finally coming to the conclusion that we need more help, um, we need more information, and we're going to drive the work we do by that data that we're going to gather. So um, I don't think that's any criticism of you. I think it's a, more of a criticism of the way we've collected data in the past and how we're going to move things forward in the future. That's um, a great way to look at it, yeah. yeah and we certainly want to be data-driven in this process. And so tell me <laughs> all the exciting things that you learned <laughs> from the data you did collect. And, and I know we talk about things like priority areas going forward. Um, what are those priority areas that you've identified and, and how are you going to work to achieve them? Well, this is a in really interesting process. The assessment, we wanted to look at as many different uh, health outcomes and indicators as we could. And we followed, for the most part, the model that the state included in their health assessment in terms of the different domains that mm -hmm. we would look at because we really wanted to have alignment with um, state plans and priorities where we could. Right. Um, one thing we did do um, is we did list first in our report the social determinants of health mm -hmm. um, and then health systems before we started to talk about any specific outcomes in terms of chronic disease or maternal and child health because really what's happening in, in uh, someone's life in terms of their economic status, their housing, their social capital, their transportation, and then their access to good health care um, is what drives all those other outcomes. Right. It's not, um, it's what we need to be looking at first. Um, and so we produced this report that looked at health outcomes in eight different domains. And then we asked our community partners, how do we begin to prioritize these? We don't mm -hmm. have a magic wand and we don't have an unlimited bucket of money. Right. So what should we be working on first? And it was a very interesting process to go through both with our collaborative and different groups of community partners to do some ranking and prioritization based on um, how relevant a problem was, how many people it was impacting, what kind of disparities were evident in the data, mm -hmm. and uh, how feasible was it for us to do something about these things. And mm -hmm. so we ended up with three air priority areas that are included in our community health improvement plan. It doesn't mean we won't address other things down the road, but yeah. this is what we're looking at first. And what made the top three? 
Okay, so our top three priority areas are supporting and nurturing healthy lifestyles. Okay. And the primary indicator we'll be looking at there is uh, the incidence and prevalence of diabetes, particularly among black residents where there's a higher rate um, than the general population. Okay. And as related to diet and exercise. Um, the uh, second category is supporting and nurturing um, mental and emotional well-being and reducing substance abuse. Mm -hmm. And so the indicators we're looking at there are um, identified higher rates of anxiety and depression among Hispanic residents okay. and then opioid use disorder. Which obviously is a very Absolutely, uh, as you know. noteworthy issue right now. Yeah. And then the third priority is ensuring access, uh, equitable and affordable access to quality health care. Mm -hmm. And so we have two indicators there that are around um, access to care for low income populations. Um, there's a lot of data in the assessment regarding people making choices to delay health care because of economics. Mm -hmm. And then also um, ensuring um, everyone has an opportunity for healthy pregnancy and healthy birth outcomes. And you know, just to clarify, the, the L&M priorities and the Ledgelite priorities are one and the same. Is that how that worked? Yeah, so it's kind of interesting uh, to think about the language around that, and sometimes I think I use, I change how I talk about it a yeah. little bit, but this is one community health improvement okay. plan, and um, it's not only L&M's plan or only Ledge Light's plan, it's the community's it's plan. The community's plan. Okay. Um, there certainly may be things in um, our next step as an organization is to develop our strategic plan, and there may be things that we include in our organizational strategic plan that are not reflected in the community health improvement plan that we're going to kind of take as a single project and work on as our own. Uh, one of them may be, for example, tobacco. We have high rates of tobacco use in southeastern Connecticut, mm -hmm. um, not included in the community health improvement plan, but something that as a health department I certainly feel like we should be addressing. Now, when we talk about the health department or the health district, um, you know, I remember the previous director of health at Ledge Light Health District used to always say, if you've seen one health district or health department, you've seen one health district or health department, <laughs> um, that it's not all one size fits all. Um, you know, whether it be funding is different, uh, the needs of the community are different, um, the staffing may be different. Mm -hmm. And we talked about, you know, you're epidemiologist and, and we don't have one at our office. Um, not to say we wouldn't like one, and not to say we wouldn't call Russ every occasion we can <laughs> to be able to get his support. Um, but, you know, there are definite variations between uh, districts, even within our own region. Um, so how do you see the districts within the, the county or within the region um, working together to support some of the things that you've seen? Um, and, and what are the differences, and how do you act independently as a health district within the region? Well, I know that you're currently going through this process um, yeah. and developing yeah. your assessment and health improvement plan. Right. Um, but some of the findings in our assessment were not surprising and yeah. will probably end up being in yours. And, you know, certainly I think uh, anybody who's looking at health and well-being is, is going to spend some time focusing on things like nurturing healthy lifestyles. Um, certainly, um, with the changes that we've seen over the last five years with the Affordable Care Act and mm. with whatever happens with its next iteration, um, we're talking about access to care and um, not only moving people away from being uninsured, but also how do they access preventive health care and screenings and well-being checks um, now that they've got that insurance card. And mm. I think that together, those are all things that we can be having um, conversations about and synergy around our tactics and um, putting our resources together, even though um, we are not responsible for the same locations. Right. Certainly, you know, disease, illness, and injury don't know where those town borders lie. Right. So, and we're so thrilled to have such a great partner in, in you and your staff. That as, as we are with, <laughs> with Ledgelite staff. Um, you know, the one thing I found interesting when I came here was there was always a discussion about the delineation between the northern tier and the southern tier of New London County and, and the differences between, you know, the two hospitals, mm -hmm. um, the differences between um, the, the rural areas versus the urban areas. And, um, you know, we hear a lot about uh, how New London County fits into the state of Connecticut or doesn't fit. Um, so maybe you can speak a little bit to um, some of the issues we in this particular part of the state, southeastern Connecticut, 
maybe face in terms of you know the data we find and then the support we need to be able to, to manage programs that will support our efforts to, to address those concerns. So we do live in such an interesting part of the state. Mm -hmm. You know, we have such a uh, beautiful shoreline available to us and, and woodlands and, um, and also an interesting population in terms mm -hmm. of um, some communities that are very rural and uh, some communities that are, while not big cities, still mm -hmm. cities. Um, and still facing some of the challenges that you see in Hartford and Bridgeport and New Haven, just on a smaller scale in mm -hmm. terms of the numbers of population. We have two tribal nations in our, in our area. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we are unique mm -hmm. and I think sometimes overlooked when um, funders at both the state and federal level are thinking about Connecticut. They're, mm -hmm thinking about putting some money into a project in Bridgeport or New Haven. And, and um, I'm pleased for that right. because those cities certainly need those attention, but, but we have those needs here too. Um, and so I think um, one of the things that's come out of that and one of our strengths as a region is we've kind of learned how to um, compensate for that by developing strong collaborations and partnerships and finding opportunities to work together. Um, you, you say things so politically well, it's <laughs> wonderful. So, so, you know, here we've got your, your issues you've identified. Um, next steps, you know, you talk about the strategic plan for the organization, which allows Ledgelight to really focus in or UNCAS to really focus mm -hmm. in on what the agency itself needs to do to address the needs of the community. Um, maybe you can speak a little bit to some of the suggested uh, uh, efforts that are going to be put forth to address at least those three priority areas um, and how many community partners it's going to take to really make that happen. Sure. Well, we just had a meeting of what has become, um, we've kind of formalized uh, what started as our advisory group of mm -hmm. community partners into the Southeastern Connecticut Health Improvement Collaborative. Okay. Um, they just met this week. and. Um, we uh, have br uh, divided into four subgroups at this point. Uh, one of them focused on the healthy living, and that group is looking at um, an inventory of current community assets in order to help, A, publicize those assets and mm -hmm. connect community resources with the things that are already out there, or community residents with the resources that are already out there, mm -hmm. uh, but B, also to identify gaps where we might be able to um, either one organization or a group of organizations secure funding to implement a program mm -hmm. or as a whole advocate um, for, for funding to fill a gap. Yep. Um, and then uh, also working that group, especially also working in close collaboration with the New London County Food Policy Council. Okay. Um, and then in the Access to Care group, um, looking at what are the barriers that people face to accessing care and uh, are there things that we can do at the system level to make it easier for people to get to their appointments, to get to preventive care, to avoid going to the emergency department for something that would be better treated in a community setting at a regular um, doctor's appointment without the anxiety and urgency that comes with going to the emergency right. department? Right. Um, well, that concept of always bringing sick people to be around other sick people has right. always been an interesting <laughs> idea in you know, emergency true. rooms. Yeah. Um, and then uh, around the mental health, we have two work groups. Um, mm -hmm. There's a group of um, providers, behavioral health providers, who are meeting regularly to develop networks, especially among the providers who speak both Spanish and English because mm -hmm. of the disparities we identified among Hispanics. Um, and to, to help, again, not only connect residents with the resources that exist, but to identify gaps and how we might implement changes and improvements. Um, and then the opioid work group includes representatives from law enforcement, from behavioral health, from clinical care, from uh, different uh, resident advocacy groups, um, our AIDS service organization, Alliance for Living, SCAD, and uh, working together, um, there is a statewide strategic plan around addressing the opioid epidemic. Mm -hmm. And uh, how can we at the local level implement some of the strategies that are included in that plan. So, so you've done the divide and conquer approach. <laughs> you know, everybody's gonna have a different area that they're gonna focus on and yet they're all gonna come together to 
solve all the problems. It's true. We actually, we had the group vote, you know, um, and the group consensus at this point seems to be that they want to come together as a big group once a month, okay. have a big group discussion, and then as part of that same meeting, break into the work group. So it does mean somebody has to be on one work group and one work group only, right. but it's also great because we do get to see the group as a whole uh, regularly and hear report outs from the other group and identify where there may be crossover if we're talking about um, ensuring access to care in terms of preventive screenings or care for diabetes that's certainly part of the conversation the the healthy living group should be having and also the alignment between improvements in the mental health care system and how that impacts on your physical health um, all of these things are interwoven so it's great that we see the whole group in addition to the work groups. So tell me, you, you obviously have the work groups operating, they're doing <laughs> fine, you don't need any additional people or help, right? <laughs> we welcome okay. additional people. So how would you like people to get a hold of you if they'd like to join one of your work groups, they want to participate, and can you be a member of the general public or do you have to work for somebody who's already participating? No, in fact, we would be really excited to have some more members of the general public join us um, mm -hmm. because uh, as uh, people who work in these organizations who are entrenched in this type of work every day, mm -hmm. you know, we're certainly giving it our all and um, have our heart and soul into it, but we do have a certain limited focus that may exclude some things that um, the people that were looking to improve things for right. have a very different perspective on that we could benefit from. So we would love for general uh, members of the general public to join the collaborative and they can call us, at, uh, call me at the office, it's uh, 860-448-4882 and I'm at extension 300 okay. or they could go to our website which is www.llhd.org and they will find the assessment and improvement plan there and send me an email and I'd be happy to bring you up to speed and have you come to our next meeting. That's great. So I, you know, I was going to mention that part is I know you make it as um, open and available to folks as they can. Um, so you know, obviously there's the, the internet based. Um, I know some folks that watch our show may not have access to the computer. Um, so I imagine you would probably even send them a copy if they needed it. Absolutely. Okay, so we have, we have a great opportunity here for the public to get involved in what we do, which I think is rare. Um, what is it about your job in the last two minutes that you enjoy? I mean, what is it that makes you go to work every day to be a supervisor for administration, finance, and special projects? Is it because you have such a breadth of work? Um, is it because you love public health? Um, tell me a little bit about how you got into your job and, and what you love about your job. Well, you can keep talking because you hit those nails right on the oh, head. Great. It is the breath of my work. I'll and <laughs> <laughs> um, I started with the district almost 12 years ago, and I came from actually running a staffing agency in Seattle. Oh. Um, and I uh, was looking to take my skills in finance and HR and technology uh, management into the nonprofit sector. Yeah. Um, and so when I joined the district as the supervisor for finance and administration, um, I was in the role of I want to do a good job to have the back office operations run smoothly so that other people can be out there improving the public health. Um, mm. And little by little, I got involved in those projects mm. that were about improving the public health. And I actually ended up uh, pursuing and completing my master's in public health uh, three years ago now. Right. Um, and so now I'm lucky enough to do a little bit of both. I still uh, handle the finances and IT and HR, but I also get to work on great partnerships um, and work with you on different projects and, mm -hmm. and work with the community on different projects. And I'm passionate about identifying um, injustices and inequities that are contributing to poor health outcomes for people um, and seeing what we can do to fix that. Well, it's been fabulous to have you on the show. We love our partnership with Ledgelight. I love the relationship we have with you. And we would love to have you back on the show again another time. Be happy uh, to do that. So thank you very much. We can uh, hopefully have people access the report. They're going to contact you to be a part of the whole process. And thanks to Jen Woodgeo and Ledgley Health District for being a part of the show today. And we'll see you next time on Public Health Matters with the Uncas Health District.